For the past 10 weeks, we have been in, in a message series inviting Jesus into all these different areas of our lives that the enemy can blind us of and the enemy can confuse us of. They're called the Ten Commandments, and they're so often misunderstood as just these laws and these rules that, that kind of an, uh, an egotistical God would give his people. Follow these, or, or if you break one of these, then you're out, and if you keep them, then I'll love you. That's not a it at all, and I hope we've seen that. I want to go back to something uh, Pastor Ken said at the very onset of our whole message series, Timeless. He said, remember that these laws are not conditions of our relationship to God, break one and you're out. These laws, these commandments are a confirmation of the relationship that already exists between us and the Lord. It's critical to remember this basic but foundational truth of our faith. Our religion is not about rules and laws. It's about relationship. And especially on Father's Day, we remember that we have a heavenly father who wants nothing more than to bless our socks off. And he knows that these these things trip us up. These nine commandments that we've been looking at. Here's, Here's nine of them that we've just been saying, God, just come and saturate our lives. Come and change our, change our hearts in all these different ways. And so today, there is, it's no mistake, though, that, that as, as the last commandment given uh, through Moses to his people that's timeless, that Jesus repeated, that Paul repeated in the New Testament, these are just principles to live by. It's no mistake <clears throat> that we're on this one today, that maybe God saved one of, the, one of the more significant ones for us for last, and I'll show you why in a moment. Today, we're wrapping it up, and, uh, and, and this commandment, is unique among the other ones. Because this is one of the only commandments in not just these 10, but in all the Old Testament law, the 613 laws found in the Old Testament. This is one of the only ones that legislates thought instead of behavior. This is the one that talks about how, teaches us how to think, not just what to do, right? So important to be reminded of this. So what is it? What is this 10th commandment? Some of you know it already. But let's read it. Exodus 20, 17 says this. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I mean, you've never coveted somebody's donkey. But let me tell you what that means. It says, in other words, do not develop an inner longing for what others around you have, not their house, not their wife, not their business, not their wealth, not their reputation, not their tools, not their vehicles, their toys, or anything else that they have. You know, if there was like a a slight chance that on my own power, I could observe all the nine commandments uh, on my own power. If there was a chance that I could muster up the strength, put boundaries in my life apart from the divine power of God, I might, might be able to do it. But God like throws this 10th one in to say, <laughs> gotcha, you cannot do any of this without the indwelling presence of the Spirit in your life because come on church we are like natural born coveters right i came out of the womb coveting and you know why i know this is because of my little 20 month old mini me levi might have seen him walking around he might not look a whole lot like me now but when i was a kid i looked just like him so but but check this out levi i'm I'm gonna make you covet for just a little bit not like you've already done it today but But Levi came out of the womb like this perfect baby. So like by the time he was like three weeks old, you parents in the room, he started sleeping through the night like on his own and never stopped. Like he just like started sleeping to this day, never wakes up in the middle of the night, right? Just this perfect little, thank you, Lord, for Levi, my goodness. And then like this past week, he like taught himself how to, he potty trained himself basically. He's like almost there. Like, by himself. Peace out, guys. I got this. 
He's like, he, he's a, a sweet boy. You saw this like little interaction. Isaac's like, I'm on the stage. And Levi's a shy, quiet, compassionate, like caring boy. He's just so sincere and, and sweet and loving. Okay, except for this one thing. This is why I know we were born to covet. So you put this sweet little child out in the yard with his arch enemy, Carter. You guys know who Carter is, right? Ken's grandson. <clears throat> we live with Ryan and Brianne doubting their son, Carter. So we, all, we live together, have fun together, all this stuff. The kids are outside. They're playing, the, just leave them by themselves. They're great. You know, they're having a good time, blah, blah, blah. They're, they're talking. Just see what happens. Watch what happens when you put a toy in just one of their hands. You just give a toy to one of them. What happens? Backyard turns into a UFC octagon. And then one of them like pulls out brass knuckles, blood starts flying, tears, snot all over the ground, right? This, this is a battle. Like Tina and I need ear surgery to repair the damage that's been done by their screaming at each other. Like we were born to covet. I'm perfectly good on my own, but the moment you place something in someone else's hands, I want that thing and give me it. I need it. It's unfair. I deserve it. Let's fight. To make matters worse, we were born with that, right? But to make matters worse, you and I are living in an in a age and in a culture where the probability that you and I are going to break that 10th commandment is that it's all-time high, and it's likely to only get worse from here on out. And though, though I don't want to spend the majority of this message on like blaming society for our heart issues, because it really is a heart issue from, from the ground up, but I do think it's beneficial to sort of take off the blinders and to see where the enemy might be, might be scheming uh, to take away uh, our, our ability to have this heart that does not covet, right? So I'm going to share a couple stories uh, with you. One's about spaghetti sauce, the other's about blue jeans, and these are going to help us reveal our societal disadvantage in this area, okay? So today, after the service, uh, go in Albertsons and look, walk down the spaghetti aisle, right? Spaghetti sauce aisle, I should say. You will find between 40 to 70 different kinds of spaghetti sauces for your enjoyment, and you say, why is this? Why all the nonsense? Why do we need that many options? Who's responsible for that? Well, I'll tell you. His name is Howard Moskowitz. Howard graduated from Harvard with a PhD in 1969. And Howard is a psychophysicist. I have no idea what that means, but I Googled it. And it says, like, psychophysicist is someone who um, measures things that are really difficult to measure. Right? So he's a research guy. So uh, Campbell Soup who makes Prego, the spaghetti sauce Prego, hired Howard back in the 80s uh, to do a little experiment, to do some tests. Because at the time, Prego wasn't doing super well. Their main competitor, Ragu, was doing a lot better, and uh, their sale, Prego sales were going down. So Howard came in to do some research. They said, Howard, tell us how to make a better spaghetti sauce. Because the, the thought, the universal thought at the time on product sales, on product development was the best way to get people to buy your stuff is to figure out what everyone likes and make that thing the best it can be. There was a subtle uh, a, a thought that everyone in general, humanity, will generally enjoy the same type of sauce if you make it good enough, the same type of product, the same type of computer, the same type of stereo system, the same type of car. We all have this shared human experience. We'll all enjoy the same thing, except, as you and I know now, today, that is kind of a flawed way of thinking. But they didn't know that at the time. So at the time, Howard uh, uncovered uh, the fact that... Uh, us as humans, we don't globally like generally one thing. We're broken up into little subcategories. Some of us like our spaghetti sauce chunky. Some of us like our spaghetti sauce thin. Some of us like visible solids in our spaghetti sauce. Some of us like it thin. Some of us like it spicy and with meat and all these different things. And so he, he, his research showed that the best way for Prego to sell more is not to make a better sauce, but to make better sauces. And this idea is called horizontal segmentation. Sounds like a really fancy word. If you've been in business in any degree, you might have heard of that term before. It's about making different categories of your project that most people, uh, that, that one of those options, somebody will like. And it works. 
Over the past, uh, he, he did that in the 80s, and for the next decade, uh, Prego made $600 million uh, on just their chunky line of sauces alone, right? It's crazy. So today, you like log on prego.com, this is what you find. This is their sauce options for you. <clears throat> It's ridiculous. They've got like four different categories and then all these different choices. Let's just explore one of the categories, classic Italian, right? Under classic Italian, there's traditional, tomato, basil, garlic, marinara, fresh mushroom, roasted garlic and herb, three cheese, roasted garlic, Parmesan, flavored with meat, uh, Italian sausage and garlic, mini meatball. This is my favorite. Garden harvest, chunky tomato, onion, and garlic. That's one word. That's one thing. Then Garden Harvest Chunky Combo, Garden Harvest Chunky Mushroom and Green Pepper, Garden Harvest Chunky Mushroom Supreme, and four low-sodium variations on these. That's just one category. prego has got 42 different sauce options available to you on their website. Thank you very much. Now, after Howard was done with Prego, <laughs> Ragu hired him. And did the same thing with Ragu. He was hired by Nest Cafe, a whole bunch of different companies to do this same idea. And now the world as we know it has changed. Now it is not so easy to walk into a store and pick out one thing. You have a vast array of options at your disposal. And as good as this may have seemed for the human tongue at the time, what effect does all this have on the human heart? Barry Schwartz is an American psychologist who released a book in 2004 called The Paradox of Choice, Why More is Less. And his research on this issue is fascinating. Barry challenged the notion that although horizontal segmentation may have been good for business, the massive increase of choices available to us does not ensure, as a matter of fact, that our satisfaction level increases. In fact, he argues that an increase of choice has caused a few detrimental side effects. The first of which is paralysis, right? And you know this, you've experienced this. As it regards to spaghetti sauce, even, there's a company in Australia, a grocery store company, who, who found out about this, uh, this side effect of horizontal segmentation and released a commercial about it. Check it out. Dad, I want to look at this. Tomato and basil, crushed tomato and basil, mm, diced tomato and basil, crushed tomato and fresh basil, whole tomato and basil, Italian tomato and basil, basil tomato and basil, puree tomato. Dad! Oh, where have you been? Oh, ah! Don't waste your life in the sauce aisle. Unlike other supermarkets, Aldi only stocks the best, so you save time and money. That's good different. Right? You have been there. Definitely. Indecisiveness, paralysis is this first side effect of these, this increase of choices. And uh, my wife asks me all the time, you've been in this situation too, driving, driving somewhere and she goes, hey Devin, what do you want to eat for dinner? You know my response. Uh, by the time I answer the question, it's breakfast, right? Like, we, it is so hard to make decisions with all the available choices out there. You know, it happens to me every time I go to Taco Bell as well, the best restaurant in the world. So you go, and you go to Taco Bell, you look at the menu, and for me, I get to Taco Bell, I look at the menu for 30 minutes before making a decision, and then, but the thing is, in the past five years, I've never ordered anything different from Taco Bell. <laughs> I ordered the same exact thing every time, but there might be something better out there. You know, there might be a different option. And, and that's the point. So but when, when we do this, when faced with this near infinite number of choices, we are not freer, we freeze instead. And why do we do this? Why do we freeze? Because as Barry points out, with all these choices out there, it is easy for us to imagine that there could have been a better option had we chosen differently. An option that may have satisfied us a little bit more. So we develop a bit of regret over every choice we make, even a reasonably good choice, right? I'm eating my Crunchwrap Supreme. It is so delicious. The melted cheese and the sour cream that comes through and the crispy tostada. You have to eat, if you order multiple things, you have to eat that one first to make sure the tostada is still crispy. So I'm eating it and I'm enjoying it, but then the thought occurs to me, what if I had ordered the quesarito instead? (laughs) Would it have been better? The answer is yes, but that's besides the point. 
As I sit down on my couch after a, a long day, the kids are finally asleep. Well, Levi's already been asleep, but the other two are finally asleep. I open up the freezer, get out a nice cold um, container of, of Ben and Jerry's mint chocolate cookie ice cream. And as I start to enjoy it, I begin to wonder, what if Americone Dream would have satisfied me more tonight? What if it would have complimented my pizza a little bit better? And then I become less satisfied in really the best ice cream flavor on the planet, mint chocolate cookie by Ben & Jerry's. So with increased choices, there is increased regret. The other side effect is that there is uh, an increased expectations. With all the available choices to us, we, we expect one of them to be really good. So Barry Schwartz, in his research, uses this illustration from his own life. He used to buy um, a pair of blue jeans at a particular store, and the store that offered the blue jeans really only offered one kind of blue jeans. Barry admits they weren't the most comfortable thing in the world. They kind of itched his legs a little bit. They didn't fit perfectly right. They're a little too long. And, uh, but he learned to live with it because that's the only option he ever had. So recently, he went into the store and said, can I have the same pair of jeans that I've always had? And the, and the store person said, nope, we don't offer those anymore. Which kind would you like? Slim fit, easy fit, relaxed fit, button fly, zipper fly, stone washed, acid washed, boot cut, tapered, on and on, blah, blah, blah. You know the available choices to you. And Barry was like, no, just give me the same junky pair of jeans that I've always enjoyed or not enjoyed. They don't have those anymore, right? So Barry said, whatever, I'll, I'll try on all these different kinds of jeans and try to find one that works for me. So after this hour-long adventure of trying on all the different kinds of jeans, he finally picked one that he actually liked better, right? There was a pair of jeans out there that uh, were better than the old pair, that were one-size-fits-all mentality. But he walked out of the store feeling worse. He admits... <laughs> He wrote a whole book on, uh, on the reason to explain this phenomenon to himself. And in that book, he discovered that because of the vast increase of choices, that he expected one of them to be absolutely perfect. And anything less than sheer perfection annoyed him. So higher expectations. The last consequence of increased choice is self-blame. Let me explain this to you. When there are very few choices available to you, you can blame the world for your discomfort, right? For example, we have a, a living, a modern example of this. If you go to In-N-Out and order a burger and you don't like that burger, well, it's In-N-Out's fault because they only make one kind of burger. Sure, you can get animal style or protein style or whatever, but really, they only make one kind of burger. A counter to that, you go to Cheesecake Factory and uh, you order dinner. And if you're not satisfied with your dinner at Cheesecake Factory, who's to blame? You, because <laughs> you suck at making choices, right? You're a bad decision maker because there's like 5,000, if you've been to Cheesecake Factory, there's like 5,000 different options on the menu. And so if I don't pick the one that I like, I beat myself up. Devin, you're just such a you just make horrible choices in your life. Like, you, you just stink at life. It's your fault. You know, it's your fault if you don't like that meal. It's your fault if you don't like that, that toy, that guitar, in my case. It's your fault if you don't like that car. It's your fault if you don't like that house. It's your fault if you don't like that job or that wife. So over time, we develop this low-grade depression. And... <laughs> As if that natural phenomenon wasn't bad enough on its own, on top of all that, today the average person spends about two hours looking at their mobile devices, flipping through social media every day, reading story after story, browsing picture after picture of healthy, wealthy, sexy people, radiating the persona of satisfaction and happiness, causing us over and over to wonder, what would our lives look like if, if we had what they had? If, if we looked like they looked, if we worked where they worked, if we married who they married. Some light bulbs going off for me. And on top of that, crafty businesses love slightly depressed people. And they seize the, they, they seize the, um, the opportunity that our unsatisfied mindset affords them. So they collectively, as a whole, as a culture, we are bombarded with 5,000 advertisements every day. 
trying to sell us happiness, satisfaction, arrival, and accomplishment through their products. And it would be one thing if we couldn't afford any of these things. Well, maybe that would just produce in us jealousy. Man, I wish I could have that, or I wish I could afford that. But with our society, what do you do instead? I'll just open a credit card. I'll just finance it instead. I can't afford it, but I can still have it. And then one day, We find ourselves with extra rooms in our house, a boat, a pool, an RV, a trophy wife, a ridiculous work schedule, and a bottle of sleep medication on our bedside tables because of the stress and anxiety and worry that we've produced in our lives to finally help us just get one night's sleep. Can you see how crafty the enemy is? And how he has been working for generations to get us to this point now where the blinders are on so thick. But let's just assume that like none of that existed. We were in a different world entirely. We didn't have that societal disadvantage. Let me tell you, we'd still be tempted to covet because the enemy from the beginning of time has been trying to, trying to get us to take more than what we have slithering his way over to Adam and Eve in the garden, trying to, trying to lie to them about the power the fruit would give them, leveraging the crack in Eve's heart who noticed that the only tree in the whole world that was off limits was desirable. And the enemy was able to convince both Adam and Eve that they needed what they didn't have. So it'd be so easy to, to, uh, to make the argument that covetousness was the heart behind original sin and that the domino started falling and coveting is now just the air we breathe from the moment we come out of the womb. So that's the problem. We know that. We've experienced it. We're sick of it. We've lived in it for so long. We're awoken to that. But what is the answer? What's the solution? So if coveting is this inner longing for what we don't have, the solution would be to be satisfied in what we do have. And the word for that is contentment. We know that. That's not a shocker. That's not some great discovery. But how in the world, in this world, do we become content? One of the most profound examples of a life lived with contentment is from the the Apostle Paul. And uh, he says himself, he kind of throws the cards out on the table, he admits and just, and just puts it out there. He says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I just, I appreciate his honesty, the secret of being intent. Paul, tell us your secret. What is your secret? How did you do that? Though there are several aspects of Paul's life that could be highlighted, I'm I'm gonna propose a few, just qualities that that Paul adopted into his regular daily lifestyle that uh, the Heavenly Father would, our Heavenly Father would love to equip us with as well, that gave Paul contentment and will give us contentment. The first thing that I notice when I look at the life of Paul is his incredible sense of purpose. He was a man who just lived with this mentality uh, day in and day out. He was extremely confident in what God called him to do specifically. And because of that, he was able to block out the noise, the criticism, all the other options surrounding him. And he knew exactly what he was supposed to do. Now, granted, like Paul had a slight disadvantage in this way because he was literally blinded by the light, knocked off his horse, heard the voice of Jesus tell him his specific purpose. Not all of us have had that kind of revelation. Some of us may have, but a lot of us still can know what God calls us to uniquely. For Paul, his mission, his purpose was to spread the message of the gospel to the Gentiles. There was, a, there was an understanding at that day and age when, when Jesus died, rose from the dead, and, and gave, gave his great commission. Even though he said it, go to the ends of the earth, there was still a little bit of confusion among his other disciples. What should we do with this message? And so they kind of kept it to themselves a little bit, just spreading this message of Jesus uh, to, to the Jews alone. The Messiah is come. Let's, let's welcome Jesus. 
Jesus as our Messiah, but, but God had a bigger plan and purposed Paul specifically, take this message outside of Judaism, bring it to the Gentiles, everyone on the face of earth. So that was Paul's mission. He knew that. And contentment and purpose are so complementary because the purpose defines his goals. For Paul, he knew exactly what he was supposed to do. It helps him say no to the things that he knew were not, not a part of that goal and was happy to delegate the rest to other people. And he's able to say yes to the things that would help him accomplish that. It helps you stay in your lane. And the beauty of purpose is that uh, the purpose in the body of Christ go hand in hand. This illustration that Paul uses all the time to talk about our spiritual gifts or abilities or or specific roles in the church at large. And he uses this illustration of the body of Christ, the anatomy of Christ, to talk about it. Some of us have heard these verses before. He says, but in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And Paul, in this context, and in Romans, and in Ephesians, lists all these gifts, all these different, all these different lanes that we could drive in and be satisfied in, and all contribute to one goal. And so, as we do this, we get to say, "Man, I am so glad, God, that you gave that person that role and that person that role, because I see how it fits into the the role at large. I see how it fits into the purpose and and the and the mission and the hope of the gospel at large. And then others can applaud our gifts and say, "Man, I'm so thankful that that person." has that gift, and we can be satisfied together. Comparison is the enemy of contentment, and it's so prevalent in our culture, but purpose is the antidote for comparison. When you're confident in your purpose, you're happy and rejoice with others. Do you know your purpose? Paul knew his. Paul also practiced this attitude of gratitude constantly. There are some uh, commentators who have actually labeled Paul, Paul the Apostle of Thanksgiving, because the theme of thanks comes up in, in nearly every one of Paul's letters. Actually, this is a kind of a fun experiment. So go to the book of Romans, the first book that Paul wrote in the New Testament. Luckily, all the books that he wrote are just back to back. And so you can start in Romans. For the next 13 books, just read the first few verses of the first chapter in every one of those books, and you'll see this theme of thankfulness, thanksgiving giving come up over and over and over again. Paul just wanted this to be a permanent part of his heart, and that's just his attitude and his posture. There's only two books in the New Testament that do not start out with the theme of thanks. One of those is the book of Galatians. We're actually starting a a new message series next week going through the book of Galatians. Should be brutal since Paul had nothing to be thankful for in that church. But uh, we'll see what Ken has to say about that. But uh, there's, there's reason for that. But other than that, the theme of thanks just overflows out of Paul's life, out of Paul's heart. He says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. There's not a whole lot of places in the Bible that talk specifically about the will of God, but this is one of them. What's the will of God for you? To be thankful. That's that's specific. You know, where am I supposed to work? Who am I supposed to marry? Be thankful. What house am I supposed to buy? Be thankful. That's the will of God for you. And this is not just some like pie in the sky, block out the noise mentality. This is the truth. Because when we boil it down, at the end of the day, in our lowest valley, in our, in our biggest struggle, in our most uh, uh, agonizing relationship, we still have the cross to latch onto and be thankful for. At the end of the day, those of us who have, have claimed Jesus as our Savior have the hope of heaven, the promise of eternal life firmly planted in our hearts and in our minds And there is always something to say, thank you, God, for your salvation. Thank you, God, for the blessing of knowing you. Thank you, God, for the the blessing of relationship and community that I just have with you and you alone, regardless of everything else is going on around me. And then anything on top of that is just gravy. And the truth is, is that we, as a, as a community in the Caneo Valley in Newbury Park, we have so much stinking gravy, it's not even funny, right? We have so many blessings, so many opportunities, so many freedoms, so much wealth and that God has given. If we can step back and say, thank you, Lord, for that, it'll go a long way towards our contentment. Paul also displayed 
and called for it generosity, this third secret of contentment. And uh, Paul saw it, saw it as a cyclical response and a source to thanksgiving. So you have this idea that uh, you're thankful, and because you're thankful, you can give stuff away. You give stuff away, and because you do that, you're thankful for how it blesses other people, and it's just this cycle. And although Paul's primary purpose was to be a missionary to the Gentiles, Paul also had a project that he was involved in, and this project revolved around generosity. And so we see that modeled in the life of Paul. If, for those of you who might not know what this project was, Paul actually did a fundraiser uh, through all the churches that he, he uh, preached to and began in the, in the New Testament uh, to give that collection of money to the poor Jewish Christians living in Jerusalem. You'll see this if you study scriptures. You'll see this come up over and over and over again. This, this fundraiser was a huge part of Paul. Paul's, uh, Paul's life. And it's because it just overflowed. Paul wanted to be generous. Paul wanted to connect and, and spread the resources. It was, a, it was a foundational aspect. And so he teaches on it. And he says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God's able to bless you abundantly so that in all things and all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Again, this cycle continues. Studies have shown, though, regardless of faith, you know, it take, it's one thing to hear a pastor tell you, it's good to tithe, you should give more. Well, just, just look into the secular world as well. Dr. Uh, Paul Piff, who's an assistant professor of psychology and social behavior at UC Irvine, says this. Those who live on less prioritize relationships because of their reduced resources. And so they're more likely to really focus on emotions that bind them to one another and find satisfaction and delight in relationships through compassion and love. As I was doing research on this, I found so many similar articles just like that written by both people who had faith in God and people who were far from faith in God. They all came to the same conclusion. Generosity helps your soul. I love it when the world like finally, finally picks up on something Jesus said 2,000 years ago. Jesus is like, literally, guys, I, told, I said that. Could you, would you just listen? Like, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. It is true, and it is true. Studies show, even within the church, tithers are more content than non-tithers. Because as Mark Moore says in his sermon on this topic, those who are able to set a standard for giving instead of a standard for living are people who live with a purpose. And again, purpose drives contentment. The other thing that Paul just attached to his life in a significant way that led to his contentment was his, was his identity. And what a critical aspect of our contentment. He was absolutely secure in who he was. You know, for us, like, it's so easy for us to get caught up in this, this idea of labels, you know, how the world has labeled us, the, the titles that we come under, that, that pour into who we think that we are. We sing songs about it to, to reorient our identity as sons and daughters of God, but some of them are bad titles and some of them are good. I mean, some titles have attached to us as, as kids that have are really hard to shake and have had negative impacts on us. Even seemingly innocent ones like clumsy, Right? Or stupid, or second best, or ugly, or not good enough, unimportant, abandoned, really hard to shake throughout our lives. But some labels are good. I woke up this morning, and I was more proud than I have ever been to wear the label of father. I'm, 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 it brings me joy in my life. Some of you, the label mother or, or brother, or son, or daughter, or teacher, or coach, or architect, or CEO. Whatever those good labels are, they're still labels that we have to be careful of. And Paul could have worn many of these labels himself, but instead, here's what he said about those labels on his life. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. This list might not seem significant to us, but extremely significant to the people he was speaking to. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But check this out. But whatever 
were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I I consider everything a loss because of the, the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Paul lived by a very simple equation. Christ plus nothing is everything. He did not need something to be added. He did not need any supplement to his contentment. It was Christ and Christ alone. And at the end of the day, we are not what we do. Thank the Lord we're not what we've done. Thank him again. We are not what the world has said about us. At the end of the day, we are children of God alone. We don't identify with our heritage, our education, our class. We're identified as children of God. And this identification, to be born for the praise and glory of God, is what ultimately satisfies Paul and will satisfy us to our core. John Piper, one of the most influential pastors of our generation, believes that humanity's purpose for existence is this, for the praise of the glory of God's grace displayed supremely in the death of Jesus. And when asked, how does humanity praise God's glory? He responds this way. God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. He goes on to say, his glory shines in your happiness when your happiness is in him. And since God is the source of greatest happiness and since he is the greatest treasure in the world and since his glory is the most satisfying gift he could possibly give us, therefore it is the kindest, most loving thing he could possibly do. Psalm 16, 11 says, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures evermore. There's one more aspect of Paul's life that, if absent, would make contentment absolutely impossible. They're they're not a secret, they're a key. If if these four aspects were a secret to contentment, then there, there needs to be, if these four secrets were a door to contentment, for example, then there needs to be a key to unlock that door, and that key is called trust. Trust is the essential ingredient that was lacking the moment Adam and Eve took a bite of the fruit. Think about it. What were the first words the serpent spoke in the Bible? Did God really say that? And in that moment, the seeds of doubt were planted in Adam and Eve's hearts. Does God really have my best interest in mind? Is God holding something back from me? Did God really mean what he said? Is there something more out there? Jesus, are you enough for me? Think about it, what would have happened to humanity if Adam and Eve trusted in God in that moment, in that great temptation? You know what, serpent? That was a nice sales pitch you did there. But I'm gonna choose to trust the one who formed my body out of the dust of the earth. I'm gonna choose to trust the one who breathed his spirit of life into my lungs and opened my eyes to see. Thanks for the offer, serpent, but I'm going to take God's word for it instead. Some of us have been considering a life of following Christ. Maybe you've tried a few things. Maybe you've tried to add some good stuff to your life. Been coming to church a little bit more. Been trying not to cuss as much. You've been trying to staple some of these commandments on your life. It's still... You just, you haven't said yet, Jesus, I believe in you. I put my trust in you. I put my faith 
in you. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you rose from the dead and I invite that spirit to become a part of my daily life. I invite you into my heart. Anyone can try those four qualities, whether you believe in God or not, but you're never gonna have that contentment, that power to overcome covetousness if you do not trust in the saving work of Jesus on the cross. We could have easily just have skipped over those four qualities and focused on Paul's last sentence in Philippians 4, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and all your ways acknowledge him. He will make your paths straight. That's the deal that Jesus is offering you this morning. Contentment for trust. Will you trust him to be your satisfaction, your savior, your God? If you want to trust him this morning, I'm going to invite you to pray along with me in this prayer. Heavenly Father, I can see now that all my longing, all my searching, all my testing has been an attempt to find what I now see is you. I've been blinded by the enemy, but today I have new sight. Jesus, I am offering you an invitation to come into my heart, into my life right now. I invite you to replace all my desires with just one single instinct, which is to give you glory and be fully satisfied in doing it. Today, I am trading my sorrow for your joy. Today, I trust the power that caused you to come out of the grave. I trust that that's the same power that's giving me new life in this moment and the hope of eternal life in heaven. Come, Jesus, and be the king of my heart the savior of my soul and the source of my contentment. In your precious name, amen. And if you prayed that prayer with me, would you just talk to me today? I'd love to just chat about what your next steps with me. Some of you may have prayed something like that before in your life, but this morning you're just prompted to re-engage in a life of trust and satisfaction. I'd love to talk with you as well. For others, this might just be causing you to think, ponder, and consider. And we're going to give you a moment to consider that during this time of communion together. If you're new to this, this is a a simple act that we do every week that reminds us of the most critical element in human history, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in a moment, the ushers will come down the aisles and pass a tray down your row. There'll be a little piece of bread, which represents Christ's body broken for you, a cup of juice that represents his blood spilled for you. You can take those and eat and drink as you please in your timing and pass the plate down to the next person. And as we do that, as we remember this, center ourselves on Jesus' satisfying love. Let me bless this. Jesus, thank you for your blood. We are so grateful for the gift of your spirit and the gift of salvation. Renew our hope and renew our trust in you as we remember you now in this moment. In your name, Jesus, amen.